Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Brian Amkrat. I'm the executive director of the Laura and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 Northeast Ohio Public Policy Series. Tonight's program coming to you from the Tinkham Veal University Center on the campus of Case Western Reserve University. Our program tonight is titled The Election for Mayor, a discussion about the future of Cleveland. Before we begin, I want to recognize and thank a few organizations who are especially instrumental in making this year's public policy series possible, uh, which includes a number of partners, uh, of course, uh, our own Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, uh, but I also want to call out the League of Women Voters, uh, Cleveland.com, uh, the Solon Community Center, the Cuyahoga County Public Library, Cleveland Heights University Heights Public Library, and the Lakewood Public Library. We are also grateful to our corporate sponsor for the series, First Interstate Properties, uh, for all of their support. I uh, want to remind everyone that tomorrow evening there will be a candidate forum at the Cleveland Public Library. There's some flyers for that on the table outside. Uh, and our next public policy sessions uh, will be uh, September 19th, which is Ohio Drug Price Relief Act ballot issue, a look at both sides. That will be at the Cuyahoga County Public Library in Bay Village. And then September 27th, a Race and Infant Mortality in Northeast Ohio, and that will be at the Heights Public Library main branch. Uh, during the question and answer portion of this evening's program, we ask that you write out your questions on uh, note cards. If you don't have one, uh, we can get you them. Just raise up your hand. Uh, and when you do have a, uh, a question, again, just hold up your hand and they will be collected and brought to the panel. Uh, it is my pleasure tonight to introduce our moderator, Leila Atassi, and she will introduce the panelists. Uh, reporter Leila Atassi has spent more than 14 years covering social justice issues, courts, the criminal justice system, and local government for Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. From 2012 until March 2017, she covered Cleveland City Hall with a focus on controversies involving the city-owned utilities in the airport, high-profile deadly police shootings, and the implementation of a federal consent decree governing police use of force. Currently, she is detailed to a special project called A Greater Cleveland, for which he is embedded with families living in Cleveland neighborhoods most affected by decisions made at City Hall. Please join me in welcoming Leila Atassi. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, to the Case Western Reserve University Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, to Cleveland.com, and to our corporate sponsor for this event, First Interstate Properties. Um, and thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful late summer evening uh, as we talk a little bit about Cleveland politics. I promise you that we will do our best to make this worth your time. Uh, so as Mayor Frank Jackson uh, seeks an unprecedented fourth four-year term, he faces a crowd of challengers hailing from the business world, from city council, from other corners of the public and private sectors. All of them say that 12 years should have been plenty of time for Jackson to leave his mark on the city. So more than anything else, this election will be a referendum on Jackson's 12 years in office as Cleveland voters decide, as you decide, if he deserves another term. Tonight, let's explore Jackson's strengths, vulnerabilities, and blind spots through the prism of some of the most important issues facing Cleveland. And we'll mine the collective institutional knowledge represented here on our panel to make some predictions about what Cleveland might look like after four more years of Jackson or with any of his challengers at the helm. So joining us uh, for this discussion this evening are Tom Barris, WKYC Channel 3 Senior Political Correspondent Emeritus, who uh, retired last year after 37 years covering stories in Northeast Ohio. He has won four Emmys, two for investigative reporting, and is a member of the Cleveland Press Club Hall of Fame. Then next we have James Hardiman, with more than four decades of experience litigating civil rights and civil liberties issues, including school desegregation, police practices, and voting rights. Mr. Hardiman is one of the region's distinguished civil rights attorneys and the first vice president of the Cleveland branch of the NAACP. And then Chris Quinn, editor and president of Advance Ohio, my own mentor at cleveland.com, who has been practicing journalism in this town uh, as either reporter or editor 
and leader of our newsroom since the 90s. Uh, coincidentally, Chris covered City Hall when Frank Jackson was serving on City Council, which will add another depth element of depth to this discussion tonight. So let's uh, begin uh, laying the groundwork by talking about what Frank Jackson was able to achieve during some very trying years um, of his tenure. To, to Jackson's credit, I think we should start off by saying that he managed to keep the city afloat during the recession foreclosure crisis despite plummeting income tax collections, deep slashes to state local government funding and other hardships. By most accounts, the city has made a laudable recovery. Today, business districts are booming. We had the RNC here, Public Square looks terrific. Opportunity Corridor is on its way. And last November, voters approved an income tax increase that pumps in an additional $80 million a year for enhanced city services. All of that serves as fundamental to Jackson's platform. But that said, Jackson's critics and challengers say his attention to downtown projects show that he has lost touch with the needs of residents in the city's most impoverished neighborhoods. And so panelists, I'm going to kick it over to you. Uh, are those valid criticisms? How do you think Jackson has done balancing the needs of his diverse constituency? And I guess how we'll roll is just whoever wants to start off, and let's just make it as conversational and, and casual as possible. Well, obviously, uh, any mayor of a big city has a mountain of huge issues on his plate. And uh, none of them are solvable by s simple formulas. You'd think I know that from broadcasting, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, obviously, uh, he has uh, picked and choosed uh, those issues that he attempted to focus a lot of energy resources on, which has resulted in the uh, the revived downtown and the new. Uh, much improved image around the country and the world of Cleveland, lar in large part due to the uh, favorable publicity uh, of the uh, of the Republican convention, even if Cleveland will now be known as the city that lodged Donald Trump. Um, so, uh, I, yes, he has put a lot of emphasis on certain neighborhoods, particularly focusing resources on downtown, um, and and now. Not coincidentally, I think, he's turning his uh, uh, attentions to the neighborhoods uh, uh, with uh, his uh, uh, neighborhood reinvestment plan targeting a couple of really down and out neighborhoods that uh, will get money from the city and uh, uh, and from banks. Um, you know, could, should he should he have done a better job with the limited resources, uh, arguably, you have three guys here who live in the suburbs who probably can't make that call as well as many of you can. But, uh, um, you know, I think I think on balance, uh, he's got a very distinguished record on this side of the ledger. And on, 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 on the other side of the ledger, I think he's he's making efforts. I know his his cliched statement is, well, you can judge the greatness of a city by how it treats the least of its residents here. So I think he's he's actually trying, as he says, to put the work in uh, with these neighborhood improvement in, uh, uh, agreements for all projects um, and, uh, you know, trying to do more of the heavy lifting uh, in the neighborhoods. Uh, but again, the question is, do the people who live in the neighborhoods feel so alienated from or distant from the projects that he's created downtown? that uh, you know, they'd be willing to roll the dice on somebody with a lot less experience uh, and a lot less of a record to go on. As I think about it, um, this is 2017, and it was 50 years ago this year that we were all very, very proud when we elected the first African-American mayor of a major city in the United States of America. So the question is, in the past 50 years, how much progress have we made? Uh, you'll recall in 66, we had the Hupp riots. In 68, we had the Glenville riots. Uh, so the question is, what role should and could a mayor play in the revitalization of the city? Uh, is the city of Cleveland, even though its image has improved considerably over what it used to be, is the city of Cleveland now a place where people want to come? Is it a destination as opposed to a place to escape from? Uh, do people who live, work, or play in the city of Cleveland, are they better off today 
than they were 12 years ago. Uh, interestingly enough, as I was walking in, someone asked me if I could vote, who would I vote for? And I had to think long and hard about that because the question is, all of the candidates have uh, issues. There is no perfect candidate. They all have flaws. And uh, you know the flaws of the top two challengers, and you probably know the flaws of the current incumbent. The question is, even though when people come to Cleveland, we're all excited to show them the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, we're all excited to show them the revitalization that's going on in Huff. Uh, but are we as excited to show them some of the places where lead paint is still peeling from houses, where children still cannot uh, get a decent uh, a bite to eat, uh, a place where our school system is still uh, uh, failing to graduate even 50% of the people who uh, start out in the ninth grade? Uh, we've made progress. But unless we can address the educational issues, the housing issues, uh, the issues related to uh, police misconduct, excessive use of force, I think we're destined to continue marching backwards because it was this administration, if you'll recall, in which police officers shot and killed Tamir Rice. It was this administration where uh, Melissa Williams and Timothy Russell were shot and killed. It was this administration where or in which the Department of Justice came in and concluded that the city of Cleveland was responsible for a pattern and practice, I'm sorry, pattern or practice of use of excessive force. And we all know against whom that excessive force was directed. We all know that we now have a consent decree and we have a community police commission and we, all have a mo we still have a monitoring commission. But the issue is whether or not people who feel that they've been misused or mistreated by the police department can find a way to have their uh, problems addressed. That problem continues to exist. And I'll concede that downtown Cleveland looks really, really good. But I'll also uh, admonish this administration about lead paint, about kids failing to graduate, about police misuse of their authority. So though we've come a long way, we've still got a long way to go. The, the perspective that I think um, you mentioned at the beginning of your question about the budget is one that, that can't be um, overestimated. Frank Jackson has been running this city at a time when then the city has been losing the revenue it had. It's been increasingly difficult to keep things going. You remember a few years ago, Detroit went into default. Uh, so And so much of that budget is consumed by things like public safety that there's not a whole lot of discretionary money in there um, to work with. Um, he, he's been, he'd been leading for years to, to the point where he was going to have to ask for that tax increase to get the money, whether that is a, it's luck for him that he got it before this election year and could start spending the money on neighborhood projects, or it's a curse because everybody's calling that political. Uh, this is the first time there's been some money to spend in the neighborhoods. But I agree with Mr. Hardiman that, that for the people in the neighborhoods right now, the biggest issue is the spray of bullets that are flying everywhere. It's, there's an incredible uh, public safety problem. And until the consent decree, this was a, police, a city with a police department that was largely out of control, as demonstrated by the incidents that uh, Mr. Hardiman mentioned. Um, Frank Jackson could have dealt with some of those without more taxes uh, and, and didn't. And it was only when the federal government came in and insist upon, insisted upon it that he did. Um, until children feel safe in their beds from gunshots, until they don't have drills at home where they have to get under the bed every time shots ring out, we're not going to have good quality of life in the neighborhoods. And that focus, even absent the money, was missing. I because it seems the conversation is headed down, down this road, I'm just going to move toward that that topic. Um, but you know, on along one stop along the way would be the subject of police reform, um, which Mr. Hardiman brought up. Uh, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone in this country who hasn't who doesn't know the name Tamir Rice, um, and we all know what happened the night that dozens of officers left their post to take part in this high speed chase and how that concluded. 
The U.S. Justice Department concluded that CPD had developed a culture of unconstitutional policing under the Jackson administration, and for the past couple of years, the department has been operating under the tenets of a federal consent decree to rectify that. Um, so my question to you is, uh, to what extent does Jackson own that? And has Jackson, Jackson's welcoming the police reform effort mitigated the policing problem as a liability for him in this election? I'm not sure the administration welcomed uh, the conclusions that uh, the Department of Justice came up with. As a matter of fact, I think they were kicking and screaming uh, when there was uh, uh, findings of unconstitutional policing in the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, we did, or they did, uh, uh, agree on uh, terms that were uh, reduced to a consent decree, uh, but it was by no means voluntary. Uh, the Department of Justice had a pretty good record of winning these kinds of pattern or practice lawsuits, and I think the city of Cleveland saw the inevitable and felt that it was better to resolve it by way of an agreement than it was to litigate it. But um, uh, at the end of the day, I still remember uh, Eric Holder uh, and Mayor Frank Jackson having a press conference, and there were a lot of backslaps and you know handshaking, and everyone was agreeing that this was a new day. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, a lot of the people have not seen that new day as of yet. Uh, we know just last year, a young man on 102nd and St. Clair, uh, in what has been commonly referred to as a high crime area, was trying to go into his house, and the police thought he was a burglar, and instead of uh, finding out if he was was or was not uh, uh, trying to break into a house, his house, they arrested him. Uh, he filed a complaint with the Citizens Review Board and is still waiting to get a response to that. So yes, we made some progress, and yes, that consent decree has a lot of good things in it, if followed, but the reality is that uh, at the end of the day, it's just a piece of paper, and unless or until uh, CPPA uh, and the police union get on board, uh, civil rights attorneys will still look at Cleveland as uh, a payday because many of these lawsuits that were filed against the city of Cleveland are coming to fruition, and the city is paying and paying dearly. Now, should people have to live under that threat? Should they have to live under a police department that uh, is not really concerned about their best interests? Uh, I doubt very seriously if anyone would say that's the case, but that's the reality if you live in the city of Cleveland, unfortunately. And as I've said many times, we've come a long way, but we've still got a hell of a long way to go. I mean, given that uh, uh, this whole effort is a, a, a very lengthy uh, work in progress, Yes, some progress has been made, but uh, a whole lot, a whole lot more needs to be accomplished. I know we've seen a number of uh, partial progress reports by the monitors who have ultimate oversight for making sure that Cleveland complies with and lives up to and adheres to the terms of the consent decree. And a lot of those spot checks along the way have said, "Well, you know, you're you're way behind schedule in terms of uh, uh, dealing with." Uh, um, citizen complaints uh, and officer accountability and uh, and uh, you know having a new and better equipment for the police so um, I don't know so much that you could say that the mayor is dragging his feet but the city is not living living up to or at least not meeting the uh, uh, meeting the benchmarks that that it, that it agreed to meet well they're part of the problem I think is is Frank Jackson uh, one, he doesn't like being told what to do when he saw the consent decree as a process for his being ordered to do something. Two, he stands by people in his administration who he probably shouldn't stand by. And so the leadership in the public safety department has been the same for a long time. He ultimately did point Calvin Williams as police chief, and, and I think anybody who saw Chief Williams during the RNC was impressed. This is a guy who who does seem to uh, to understand the city a good bit. So uh, there is movement there. One of the biggest problems that the Justice Department found is the police department is seen as almost an occupying force in Cleveland because the officers aren't from Cleveland. That's a long-term process to fix. Uh, this summer, uh, the, 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 there's a police foundation that's now tied to the police department um, brought 65 kids from Cleveland neighborhoods in for a five or six week camp at Tri-C 
and they're hoping that they start building a pipeline of Cleveland people, Cleveland residents to become police officers. If they get to that point, if that's successful, that whole feeling of the occupying force should subside, but that doesn't happen overnight. One of the things the mayor complains about quite a bit, and I think legitimately as something that's beyond his control, is the uh, the difficult uh, terms that he has to operate under with the police contract, where repeatedly uh, they attempt to discipline officers, in many cases fire or suspend them, and uh, the vast majority of cases wind up getting reversed and people getting reinstated to their jobs and uh, getting back pay because of the, uh, uh, the process that... Uh, goes on uh, uh, through arbitration. I mean, I, I, maybe we're fast forwarding here to things that a new mayor would have to deal with or worry about. But I think uh, you know, whenever the police contract does come up for uh, review, uh, I think uh, the, the, the mayor would want to make an effort to have the terms of that contract uh, modified somewhat so the city doesn't go through this uh, repeat, uh, riding the merry-go-round process of firing, rehiring, firing, rehiring. Um, uh, again, it's, it's obvious that uh, the, the, the system seems to work uh, largely in favor of, uh, of, the, uh, of the union. What's a little bit distressing about this campaign is with public safety being the number one issue and all of the candidates talking about it, you're not hearing much in the way of concrete plans for dealing with what's going on in the neighborhoods. You hear some things about police accountability. Uh, Eric Brewer has put together a plan where he, he says he would be much stricter with, um, with police misbehavior. Um, but other than saying you'd hire more police officers, which is hugely expensive and nobody's saying where the money comes from, you're not seeing many ideas for how this, this violence problem is going to be dealt with. Uh, and and that should be if it's the number one issue, that should be the idea where they're the, the, that they're competing on. I'm not sure I would agree that it's the number one issue. It's one of the main issues. Education, arguably, is also a major issue that we should be trying to address. Uh, police misconduct is extremely important because the perception of many residents of the city of Cleveland is that the police force is an occupying force. And uh, anyone that has lived in the Cleveland, works in the city of Cleveland, or uh, uh, plays in the city of Cleveland is aware of that, particularly if they are people of color. Now, if you live in the burbs and you come into Cleveland for your nine to five gig, and then you go home, maybe you don't see what's going on in the city. But uh, yes, there is a significant amount of black on black crime. I'm the first one to acknowledge that. Uh, and there's no excuse for that. But by the same token, that can't be used to justify police misconduct. We all are aware of what happened in Euclid. Euclid's not Cleveland, and the mayor of Cleveland has nothing to do with what goes on in Euclid. But the reality is that police and police unions have an inordinately large amount of influence. And unless we start taking a look at the police uh, union contract, we're going to have these same problems uh, 50 years from now when we have another uh, uh, anniversary and we celebrate the 100th year of Carl Stokes being elected mayor of the city of Cleveland. So, yes, we've got police problems. We've got education problems. We've got a dilapidated infrastructure problem. Uh, lead paint continues to be a problem. All of these are things and issues that whomever is elected mayor of the city of Cleveland is going to have to address. And at the end of the day, we fight hard to avoid a collapse like what happened in Detroit. But would a collapse be all that bad if we could get some of these problems fixed? That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> Before we move on from we, the issue of... We say at least we're not Detroit. <laughs> you want to take that away from us? Uh, <laughs> uh, before we move on to the next topic, I wanted to throw this question out there. That, uh, I think, Chris, you mentioned that uh, Calvin Williams was installed as, as police chief, and he seems to be well-liked in that position, both by those in the ranks and, and citizens. However, f the former police chief, Mike McGrath, is Sid, the safety director, and... Marty Flask, the former safety director, is still in the orbit in City Hall and very influential. Uh, if given four more years, you know, 
first, I think that it's um, one of the criticisms that many people have of Frank Jackson is that he tends to be loyal to a fault. I've heard it so many times that he keeps those on board who might not necessarily deserve their position or aren't necessarily the best fit for those jobs. So if he is given four more years, will Frank Jackson help CPD become a better department or will that goal be hindered if he doesn't replace his top police brass, talking about Mike McGrath specifically, who oversaw the department when it was at its worst? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, the, the mayor has been pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed you know, with a lot of people saying McGrath must just go, Flask must go. But again, the more, the more, given his personality, the more you push him, uh, the less likely he is to take that step or reach that conclusion. I mean, I think both of those uh, 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 gentlemen are well, well, well past the uh, eligible age uh, for retirement, and I'm, I'm sure there's some... Uh, I think they've uh, retired a couple times. Yes, I know, right. <laughs> uh, Double, double dipping and those sorts of things involved. But I mean, the mayor, as you say, is uh, painfully loyal to people who have been loyal to him. I mean, another case in point of there was that, that very large scandal involving firefighters over time and uh, all the issues surrounding that. And, and the chief who was on duty uh, during when all that was ha happened was sort of uh, allowed to quietly retire and tiptoe off the stage mm -hmm. with out any real meaningful consequences. So uh, do, do I think the mayor would be likely on his own to discharge uh, Mr. McGuire, Mr. Flask? If he hasn't done it now, I don't think he's going to. I think it will be their call to, to serve uh, um, to serve as long as they want. Mm. There, there are already whispers that Calvin Williams would be a candidate for mayor in four years. And if, if Jackson is interested in grooming a potential successor, you could see him bringing in bringing Calvin Williams in as public safety director, possibly. Um, it is astounding that he has stood by McGrath. McGrath, two years before the consent decree, we did a series on police use of force, and he absolutely refused to acknowledge there was an issue, even though every use of the taser was ruled as justified, which is just ridiculous in any, in any measurement. Mm -hmm. and, and, but as Tom says, once you push him on something like that, he locks in and he will not change his mind. It's yeah. kind of interesting that, Tom, you brought up the situation involving the, uh, the firemen uh, that were uh, trading shifts. Uh, I believe there were 13 firemen that were involved in this process. 12 were Caucasian, one was African American. And? Guess which one got fired? <laughs> the African American. The other 12 all kept their job. And right now, there's litigation going on as to whether or not there was any legitimate business reason to fire the one black person who was involved in trading of ships while all the other 12 white uh, uh, firemen retained well, their position. Wasn't he the firefighter who basically showed up uh, you know, once every four months and was working was in, in California? In California. California. <laughs> Actually, he was substitute teaching in Cleveland. Okay. So yes, but he was similarly situated. He did the same thing the others did. He traded shifts, and he traded more shifts, but he did trade shifts. Now, arguably, uh, a federal judge will have to make that decision, but the reality is they all did the same thing. 12 were white, one was black, the one black man got fired, the 12 white kept their jobs. Mm -hmm. and just another quick observation here uh, from an old, old TV guy. The city would have had uh, much more damage to its reputation if it had been working with 20th century technology and it had dash cams on its cars during the crosstown Timothy Russell, Melissa Williams chase. I mean, could you imagine the national publicity and how many times we would have seen that story on national news over and over and over again if there were video of the uh, um, the hail of bullets in the crossfire and, and what actually transpired? I mean, the, the, um, I'd argue that I, I was surprised that city didn't, uh, that, that incident didn't generate more but national if, attention and publicity I, and outrage. If they had the cameras, though, I'd argue the incident wouldn't have happened because then there would have been accountability and they would have known it. I think they probably would have been, been guided by the knowledge that everything was Possibly. on the cameras. Okay. So I guess we'll move on then to the next topic, which has come up a couple times so far already, uh, violence on the streets. After the city's income tax 
increase passed, Jackson pledged to uh, build a comprehensive anti-violence initiative that draws together intervention, street outreach, social programming, workforce development, and community policing. To oversee it all, he named longtime federal and county prosecutor Dwayne Deskins as the city's new chief of prevention, intervention, and opportunity for youth. In June, the city announced that they had hired new personnel. They had begun expanding the presence of violence uh, interventionists in hospital emergency rooms and on the streets. They offered 500 some jobs to teens, and they expanded hours and programming at the recreation centers. A lot of critics say, too little, too late. We're at the end of his third term, and now he's just beginning to roll out this, uh, these initiatives. Uh, so panelists, what do you think? Does this appear to be a lot of lip service uh, to uh, a very, very important uh, problem, or are these initiatives a good start on a path toward something greater in Jackson's fourth term? You're never going to be able to arrest your way out of this kind of an issue. And by the people who suggest we need more police officers, we need uh, Dwayne Deskin in a position where he can uh, uh, put in place some uh, uh, strategies to eliminate street violence, uh, this is the Band-Aid approach. And I would argue that uh, we need to develop some type of program for children so that they can get summer jobs. We need to uh, provide training for some of these kids. A kid that has no has lots of time and nothing to do with it and no money is going to get into trouble. That's the reality of the situation. Well, wasn't a big part of this program, Bill, is also not just being about uh, enforcement. I know that special unit, NICE, what does that stand for again? I can't, I'm very bad with acronyms. But, yeah, I know what you're talking uh, about. But, but I think wasn't a big part of the program, supposedly what you're talking about, to, to create more, uh, job prospects, uh, to create more training prospects, to, uh, you know, to work with children and, 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 and steer them, steer them out of trouble before, uh, before they get too far down the path. I mean, it, it, was there a large social service component to this program, I think? Yes, there, there were a lot of social service components, but the reality is very little has been on the social service side and most of it has been on the uh, arrest and prosecution side. Uh, Dwayne, who I know and like as a person, is a former prosecutor. That's what he knows. He knows how to arrest people, how to charge them, and if necessary, put them in jail. I've heard him say that uh, if you don't give somebody up, you'd get no deals. And basically that suggests that uh, let's get hard, tough on crimes and criminals. Uh, well, we've tried that. Just say no, those type of strategies. Get tough on crime. Those strategies don't work. And I think that... Uh, we've got to focus a lot more on the social service side. Even though there's something in there about social service, we haven't gone far enough for long enough. But, but Jackson also points out that the violence is a symptom, that the problem is really the poverty that racks the city. And his attempts to deal with that have been through the transformation plan to improve education, which is very slowly uh, moving up, and his community benefits program to make sure people in the city get to participate in the, the huge projects that are going on. That's a, that's a slow build. You can't do that overnight, but if you can, if you can help people get out of poverty, get out of the hopelessness, that, that can cut into violence. Well, and, and I can't disagree with that, but it was 1954 when uh, the Supreme Court said the separate uh, was unequal. It was 1973 that the NAACP filed its lawsuit against the Cleveland Public Schools alleging that they were operating a dual system, one for whites and one for blacks. So uh, and I think it was the 1980s when uh, uh, the judge gave mayoral control of the schools uh, to uh, the city uh, uh, executive officer, which was the mayor. Uh, so I don't know that we can say it's a long process and use that as an excuse. It's been more than 60 years that we've been trying to get a handle on education uh, with a lot of very good, knowledgeable uh, educa uh, educators. So if the mayor of the city of Cleveland is the only person in the city that has control of the schools, I would imagine we would be doing a lot better than all the other school districts around the state that don't have mayoral control. There was a reason for it. Now, have we seen the results? Uh, mayoral control was given to the mayor in Mike White's Mike administrations. White, right. That was how many administrations ago? Uh, three. And we still are trying to get a handle on uh, per, uh, better performance. 
uh, fewer dropout rates, teenage pregnancies. These are issues that, in my opinion, along with uh, excessive use by the police are things that must be addressed and must be given a priority. And if we simply focus on arresting uh, juveniles and not giving them a second chance, then I think we're missing, missing the mark by a substantial uh, uh, way. I'll put Mike White and Jane Campbell aside because we're talking about the legacy of Frank Jackson. Four years ago, five years ago, he, he persuaded a Republican legislature, a Republican governor, to help rewrite some laws to build this, this transformation plan, working with Eric Gordon, superintendent, who's a, a real educator. And it, knowing that this would be a, a slow build, but they have seen the graduation rate increase a, a few ticks. They have seen the dropout rate drop a few ticks, enough that, that residents at the four-year interval went and reauthorized the tax to pay for it. So, so if you're looking at, at, at these last 50, 60 years, the first time you've seen the, um, uh, the number of people attending Cleveland schools go up has only been in the last few years. It had been a steady decline. So maybe we're seeing the beginning of that, that rise. But the question is, 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 it, is the progress far enough and, and, and is it fast enough? I mean, when, it'll when, never when the, it'll, Well, you're right. But I, but I mean, when, no. the, when the school system still gets an across the board FFFFFFF report card, uh, it's pretty hard to put a good face on that. Yeah, that, that actually was the next topic I was going to introduce. <laughs> but uh, yeah, ha have, have the improvements been too incremental for, ju I mean, just this past week at the City Club, that was one of the key talking points that Mayor Jackson brought to the table was that the school transformation plan has been a success. Uh, and well, so- I don't think he said a success. I think he, he was saying it had moved a few moved ticks. Incremental improvement. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I have, went to a 50-year uh, yeah. reunion uh, last weekend for the Glenville class of 1967. And uh, one of the issues was of those people that graduated from Glenville High School in 1967, which was 50 years ago, how many of them would send their children to a Cleveland school? Even though they were very proud of what they did 50 years ago and how far they had come, and they talked about Metz and Baum and a number of other people that went to Glenville back in the 30s, and uh, uh, Mike White, who became mayor of the city of Cleveland, a Glenville graduate, and everyone was very happy and very proud, but they weren't sending their children to Cleveland schools. And one of the pro unfulfilled promises of the school desegregation was to make the Cleveland schools uh, a magnet so that people who lived in the burbs would want to send their children to Cleveland schools. We had that uh, school down on uh, Lakefront, Aviation High School. What kid would not want to become a pilot and you know fly off into the wild blue yonder? Uh, now it's locked, boarded up, and used as a storage facility, and scheduled to be torn down. So, yes, we've made in the last few years uh, some incremental improvements, but uh, by the same token, the charter school movement is taking off. And a lot of people who otherwise would be sending their children to Cleveland public schools are now sending their children to charter schools. Whether that's good, bad, or somewhere in between, the perception is that the schools are not the places that they want their kids to go. I mean, With the possible exception of John Hay High School. With that exception, or if you want to play football, Glenville. But other than those two, uh, the incremental improvements I don't think are enough to satisfy the average citizen. I mean, we've seen a big influx of, of young people moving into the city and moving downtown. I mean, the big question in the next chapter is going to be, well, what happens when those young people start young families and have children that are of age and they have to decide, where am I going to send my child to school? Will we see a, a big stampede uh, out of the city uh, because the schools haven't uh, made uh, the leaps and bounds improvements that they need to? I also was wondering, ha has anyone heard anything impressive from any of the challengers on where they would take the schools next? Has, has that even been introduced into any of the forums? Or I think, uh, I, I've, heard yeah. thing, I've heard things about you know, more vocational training, yeah, for instance. job training. A, a couple of the candidates talk a lot about building job training centers, that their focus would be preparing uh, Cleveland's youth for jobs. But, but other than saying job right. training centers, it's pretty vague. Brandon Krastowski has a record of, 
of uh, providing jobs and training, and he said he would expand that. Uh, and he, even though he's another guy named Eric, Eric Brewer said he would fire Eric Gordon uh, if he became mayor because the plan wasn't proceeding well enough. Hmm. So I, I want to move now on to uh, uh, the topic of building and housing. And, and I, this is a, a multi-pronged issue, really. On one hand, we have the decay of the city's housing stock, and, and Jackson has at times embraced demolition when the money is available, yet he's resisted enforcing housing code on those who can't afford it, especially the, the elderly. On the other hand, we've got the lead paint problem. Thousands of children were exposed to toxic levels of lead paint in their homes while city, city health officials failed to investigate and a backlog of unresolved cases started to grow. With the income tax increase, Jackson hired a team of inspectors to focus on identifying hazards at rental properties. They're working on a five-year timeline, but it's unclear how the city would handle hazards when they are identified through this process. So, to the panel, what do you make of Jackson's approach to building and housing these past 12 years? What will Cleveland's housing stock look like in four years if he's reelected? If you drive down Chester, uh, you can see some very grandiose uh, houses. However, if you go uh, either north or south, mm -hmm. between 105th and maybe 55th, or maybe downtown to 30th, uh, houses are falling apart, lead paint is flaking, uh, children are, that's where the people that have children are actually living. And uh, we know that uh, Judge Ray Bianca, who died just last year, uh, had some programs that he thought would give homeowners some incentive to try and uh, straighten out the problems they were having with the housing stock. But um, I think that was a step, but it was a little baby step. And uh, I think that uh, this lead paint crisis was magnified not by the administration, uh, but by a series of articles that appeared in the Plain Dealer that exposed mm -hmm. what was going on in the city of Cleveland. This lead paint crisis is not new. We've had lead paints for, uh, on houses that is toxic to children and, in fact, creates an environment in which children cannot learn, cannot eat, cannot grow, and realize their potential. This has been going on for at least the last 75 years. But when the Plain Dealer started to expose it, then some movement was made. And yes, there were some uh, uh, additional housing inspectors, uh, and there, were some, there was some prosecution of some of the people who were involved with maintaining houses that were not up to code. Um, will this continue? I would hope this would be probably the third or fourth priority. Uh, the Legal Aid Society has pending at the current time a lawsuit against the city of Cleveland because of the lead paint fiasco. So are we headed in the right direction? Will the new administration or the old administration, if they get reelected, will they address this issue? Uh, and I recognize and appreciate the fact that money is a problem. To hire housing inspectors is difficult if you don't have the money to hire them with. So while we recognize the problem, somehow we've got to put more into the infrastructure of the city as opposed to uh, putting more into uh, the prosecution of people that have gone astray. I know the city has gotten and spent a lot of money that it got from federal sources and state sources and court settlements and like DeWine passed out. I mean, if I, if I had a dollar for every press conference with the mayor in front of a house and a, uh, a bulldozer taking one good whack at the house that I covered, I could probably buy myself a nice dinner anyway. So I, they, I mean, they, I think they've, they've, they've been trying to use the resources they have but there's, the problem is so immense and so huge and it's just you know, uh, not capable of being addressed by the limited city budget. But, but there's no way of looking at the lead uh, issue as anything but a failure of the administration. They dropped the ball on this. They well, didn't. You hear the stories about money they lost because they weren't. Because they weren't, the, they weren't and, yeah. they, and they didn't follow up and they didn't send the reports to the state they needed to stand, send. Uh, the, the way they're dealing with it now, Frank Jackson's got a philosophy that that the, ha the city has too little affordable housing. And if you just go through and demolish all of the houses with lead paint, you won't have enough housing for people of lesser means. So he's hoping that some abatement can be used. In the meantime, though, children are exposed to lead, and that just not, should not be acceptable. 
-hmm. So moving on to uh, public utilities. For most of Jackson's first two terms in office, customer service at the Cleveland Water Department was a, a disaster. Thousands of pending bills backlogged the system and call wait times were abysmal. Jackson eventually hired a turnaround firm uh, that not only righted the ship for the, uh, for the utility, um, but it created enough operational efficiencies to give ratepayers a three-year break from rate hikes. Meanwhile, however, Problem, there's always however, <laughs> problems seem perennial at Cleveland Public Power, where Jackson let leadership there make horrible decisions. Ill-advised purchase power agreements that proved extremely costly, investments in coal power plants, and an expensive failed proposal to build a trash burning facility in the city. Also, the city currently is fighting a class action lawsuit claiming that CPP charged its customers hidden fees for decades. All of this at CPP with no regime change whatsoever there. Uh, so to the panel, what do you think? <laughs> Are utilities a net win for Jackson in this election, or does this department represent Jackson's undue devotion to longtime city officials who have been loyal to him through the years? The water department is the much bigger issue because it serves the entire region. Um, and this is another case of Jackson not liking being told what to do. As media, all the media in town were reporting the customer service problems, he just got his back up. And it took him probably two years to fix it, but he did fix it. Um, but, but put that aside, Cleveland has one of the best water departments in the country. Uh, while Toledo had no redundancy in its system when the algae came in and they had to shut it off, Cleveland has the ability to work with that. There was a huge investment during Mike White's years in the infrastructure of the water department. Uh, there continues to be investment. Frank Jackson has used the water department uh, and, the, and his ability to maintain the lines in the suburbs to work cooperative agreements with other, with other governments to be cooperative in business poaching. I mean, all in all, the water department today is a very, very strong uh, agency and probably can be looked at as a win. I think in a lot of ways, I mean, I think he's, I don't want to say fixed all, but by and large neutralized it as an issue, I think. Yeah. And CPP is a smaller issue. Um, we're, we're just discovering some of the, uh, the issues there. I don't know that that's resonating with the public like the Water Department did, uh, so that's, we'll have to see. I kind of want to use this, though, to talk about the, the issue of loyalty. How much do you think, how to phrase this, how much do you think Frank Jackson's appointments over the last 12 years might have held back his administration? If you think so. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but. <laughs> I, I don't think the water department's an example of that. Oh, I don't think the water department's an example of that. That's largely had pretty good leadership through the years. Uh, the, the customer service issue was, was something different. Well, more generally. But then. in other departments, I, 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 yeah, I think that there have been a number of cases, we've talked about it in public safety, where he stands with people far too long. Nothing, nothing from? <laughs> okay. And I, I kind of wanted to, let's see, where are we on time? conclude with uh, the airport, really. You know, Cleveland Hopkins Airport in recent years has weathered problems from maintaining its air carriers to plowing snow on its runways. In 2014, the administration seemed blindsided by United Airlines' announcement that it would drop its hub at Hopkins. United's lease agreement requires the airline to continue paying on the outstanding debt on Concourse D until 2027, but the lease also gives the airline exclusive use of that 16-gate facility which pretty much leaves that concourse as a ghost town at an airport that's really struggling to attract new carriers. Then, in 2015, the FAA investigated a complaint, a complaint filed by an airfield maintenance worker and slapped Hopkins with a pretty costly civil penalty for violating an agreement to adequately staff snow removal teams and de-ice runways. Jackson recently hired a city hall outsider. This is one, one uh, department that has uh, benefited from his, you know, looking outward um, and you know the the new uh, air the new director of port control is a longtime airport operations consultant we're yet to see what he's going to do but has jackson done enough to dodge the airport as a liability in this election season if he's reelected, will the airport continue to be a source of dysfunction for the city from time to time 
you know, there was a point five or six, maybe seven years ago where that, the airport was just a hole and the, 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 the bathrooms, people wouldn't use them um, and, and they've invested a lot of money in making it better. The, the snow removal issue, which Layla was, was the one that uncovered, was, was a scary issue because if, if the snow isn't cleared, you don't want to land there. You don't want to be taking off there because you can be in serious trouble. Um, the FAA hit them with a huge fine for this, and, and it kind of remains to be seen how that's rectified. Every winner kind of raises the question, will Hopkins be safe? Uh, and I don't think we know. I don't think we ever got it. Did, did we ever get a, uh, a definitive answer? I remember the former airport director said, well, he didn't give me enough money to, uh, well, but, but your budget is independent. So I didn't have enough money to hire these people. So uh, I was always a little bit fuzzy on whether the accountability was with the mayor or the people running the That's airport. That's a great but, question. I just want to throw out there that I put in a public records request. Still waiting for, for it, huh? <laughs> I waited so long that we, the whole world eventually lost interest and the whole FAA thing was resolved by the time we received the records. This is a whole so. other topic. Uh, and they're, fun they're, public they're records, to, City Hall. They approach the public <laughs> records and transparency. But That's right. They did. The, the, F, the, the, the sad thing here was the FAA came in and they made an agreement with the city on how they would, would solve this problem. And when the FAA came back later and saw these complaints, the city had not lived up to it. That's what, that was the reason for the fine. That They had worked out a deal and then the city dropped the ball on that deal, possibly endangering people. So. Mm -hmm. It was never clear to me ultimately whether it was uh, Director Smith's fault or the mayor's fault or... Well, ultimately, yeah. it's the mayor's fault, right? You right. Know, the, the yeah. It's his watch, his, his team, right? Yeah. All right. It's kind of interesting that yeah. this is becoming a referendum <laughs> <laughs> on Frank Jackson's 12 years. Uh, and I guess other than what the other candidates have actually said or shared in right. public, uh, we can't criticize them like we are criticizing Frank Jackson because they have never ran a major city with all the problems that are associated with running a, a city this size. Although we can talk about the two councilmen because mm -hmm. their, their big complaint is that Frank Jackson didn't do enough for their neighborhoods. And his retort to them is, you're the councilman, that was your job. You know, when I was a councilman, I took care of my neighborhood. And th that's an interesting debate on who's to blame for that so I, think, I think Councilman Reed's main issue is a lack of urgency in regard to the increasing homicide rate and the violence. And here we are, we're on a track for another year of 100 plus and 100 really plus plus uh, homicides, which would be the third or fourth in a row. And I know he's fond of saying that during Frank Jackson's time in office, more people were killed in Greater Cleveland than the entire population of Brattonall, which is 1,220 something. Right. But uh, um, I mean, I mean, Mr. Reed, I don't want to say he's a Johnny One Note, but in terms of what's important to him on a campaign here, but he does raise a legitimate question. I mean, I, are enough dramatic things being done to, to try and uh, to try and reduce so many of these senseless homicides? On, on the other hand, uh, you know, Frank Jackson, he, his response to that is, well, what do you suggest, you know, Zach Reed? I, I can't tell you how many um, events I've been to that Zach Reed has organized where he brings everyone to the table to have a huge discussion about violence, right. but then his follow-up has been pretty weak, don't you think? I mean, it's... Uh, well, he um, says he would hire 400 additional police officers, right. but the money for that you'd have to cut somewhere to be able to to pay them. Right. Well, and, and also I feel like in the past he, he hasn't necessarily demonstrated the grasp on how much that might cost the city in general. And um, so there, you know, I, I see, I, I, I understand where Frank Jackson comes from in that regard. But Mr. Hardiman's right. This, I mean, this election, I think you started this out. This is really a referendum on Frank Jackson less than it is a battle of the Who's the best candidate? Right. So, the, what is the question? Is he out of? Is is he, uh, you know, in danger of, uh, you know, uh, being Bernie Kosar and having a last uh, term with diminished skill set? Uh, is he uh, run out of new ideas? And the last four years would uh, just be uh, 
uh, overseeing and, and babysitting the initiatives he has, uh, he's launched already. Does, That's what he says. Yeah. I mean, he, he wants to see through the consent decree, the right. transformation plan, the community benefits. I mean, and the it, difference in the next four years is the city, because of the right. tax increase, has some money. So, so you might see changes in the neighborhoods that had not been there for the previous 12. Right. Well, I mean, if you, if you vote for another candidate beside Frank Jackson, obviously it's, it's a gamble, it's a risk. Uh, he, I think, ultimately concluded that none of the other candidates running were capable or worthy of continuing the, important, uh, the importance efforts he has underway. Um, I think I've heard that, but I've got some concern. Is that ego? Yeah. Uh, or does he really have any legitimate and, and, and defensible reasons as to why the other candidates cannot run a major city? Before he was elected well, mayor, what was he doing? Right. He was a councilman. No, I think after the city club debate, it occurred to me as I was walking out that if you combine the business acumen of some of those candidates with the institutional knowledge of other candidates and, you know, the, the track record of others, you could have the perfect candidate. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we'll, we'll wrap up this portion of the discussion by, you know, just asking of the, of the rest of the field, what has impressed you? Is there, is there someone's uh, um, platform that you think, uh, you know, could actually, no matter who is the mayor next, they could play a role in the administration and, and at least set the, the course for the city in, in the right direction in well, one Mr. small Mr. way? Mr. Krastowski with his, with his very successful program, the training former inmates and giving them jobs in, in, in the restaurant mm -hmm. industry, he claims that he, he wants to build five uh, job training centers around the city. I mean, that would seem to have some merit. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the one thing that stands out to me. But it, what's, what's the, a couple of the exceptional things here? Actually, have two Republicans running. I mean, I thought I thought they were uh, I thought they were like unicorns. You know, you actually have two <laughs> Republicans running in a mayor's race in Cleveland. That's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> and I think that maybe offers some hope for the future of uh, um, you know younger uh, younger Cleveland residents from the business community maybe wanting to contribute in some fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, I too am somewhat impressed by the idea that we can create jobs for people. Uh, that seems to me to be about the most solid thing that I've heard from any of the candidates. And that has been missing uh, for the last 12 years. We've talked about police issues, we've talked about education, but unless we can figure out a way to uh, find a place for the unemployed to become employed, I think we're destined to continue to have problems. Mm -hmm. Nothing, Chris? <laughs> well, you know, if you, if you walked onto planet Earth last week and saw that debate and knew nothing else, I think you would have walked out saying that Eric Brewer had the most concrete ideas and the clearest command of the issues. But of course, if you then go to Eric Brewer's Facebook page where he rants and raves and lacks any sense of civility and you know the history, then that falls apart. But if you're looking for, the, for a concrete agenda, I mean, he has a very clear public health agenda, very clear public safety agenda, and that's surprised me. All right. Well, let's do some audience questions here. Um, this is a good one. Should there be term limits for the Cleveland mayor? Well, <laughs> you, you look at the, all, all of the extraordinary mayors that Cleveland has had, Tom Johnson and, you know, Newton D. Baker and George Voinovich and Mike White, and nobody even attempted to do what Mayor Jackson is doing, mm -hmm. try for a fourth term. So, um, you know, is Mayor Jackson putting himself in a category uh, above and beyond and uh, in some sort of a super mayor uh, classification here by, by striving for this, uh, you know, uh, this extra four years that nobody's even attempted to achieve uh, before? I guess since, since nobody thought that anybody would ever run for a fourth term, <laughs> nobody thought it would be necessary to... If, if the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, all right, well, I'll, I'll try to condense it here. Uh, ba basically, uh, um, you know, Frank Jackson is doing something that none of Cleveland's uh, historically great mayors have even contemplated doing before. Uh, and, and so it's... You know, nobody, nobody ever thought that there would be a need, I think, to, you know, cap the term limits that, uh, you know, the, natu the political natural order of things would just have constant turnover. So, um, you know, is, is, 
I guess it's a debatable issue. I, I don't know how many other big cities have uh, term well, limits on their chief executives. If Jackson had not run, I think you would have seen other, other very candidates. highly qualified right. candidates run. And so you know, 12 years is a long time. I mean, you, you can leave a lot of mark on a city after 12 years. Mike White did. Frank Jackson has. Um, but his presence, I think, kept out some candidates that voters would have been very interested in seeing. I have very mixed emotions about term limits and uh, age limits because we all know that judges cannot uh, uh, retain uh, run for office after they uh, turn 70. So is that a violation of the anti-discrimination law against old, old judges? Uh, maybe we should have some prohibition against old politicians. <laughs> uh, but I have some serious concerns about that kind of thing. And if people get the kind of government that they have chosen, then that's what they're entitled to. Take a look at the presidency. <laughs> Here's another question. If you had to name the most influential person in leading Cleveland forward, is it the mayor of Cleveland? If not, who is it or who could it be? Who else is a top mover and shaker? You know, I think a lot of people thought when the county um, changed its form of government that the county executive would ultimately rise to be the more powerful position. Uh, the county has all the social service taxes and provides a lot of the services uh, that are important. But so far, it seems like the mayor remains the number one mover and shaker. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. It's the mayor. Hmm. Although, uh, I guess by nature of the agreement here, I, with the, the now dead in the water Q deal here, but it was, it was the county executive who I think did all the negotiating on it because the county was primary party, but I think uh, a number of people maybe thought that Mayor Jackson should have been more aggressive or more active or uh, uh, more involved. Uh, my sense was that he just ratified what they presented him. Yeah, I, I think part of the problem with the Q deal was in a mayoral election year and became very, very political. Um, and Jackson may have decided this to not get heavily involved for that reason. Right. So to that, to that point about the Q deal, another audience question is, uh, is about the impact of the announcement that the Cavs would be pulling out of the funding arrangement uh, with the city to update the queue. What is the overall impact to the city, do you think? Do you think that they'll come back at it another way? Jobs, money, uh, opportunities. Uh, but this was our democracy at work. Um, a number of people wanted more from the Cavaliers than was being presented, and they d went about it the right way. And um, uh, the Ohio Supreme Court said that it was a ballot issue, and Dan Gilbert decided to take his ball and bat or his Nikes and basketball and go home. Uh, what will this mean moving forward? Uh, a lot of people will not make a lot of money. The uh, uh, All-Star game will not be played in Cleveland uh, next year or year after. Uh, Cleveland may pack up and leave and follow LeBron out to... Uh, uh, Los Angeles, who knows? But I think at the end of the day, it's a lot of money that will be lost. I think maybe this uh, uh, diffuses this as uh, being an, as important an issue as it might have been in the mayor's race. I mean, I know it's very unlikely mm -hmm. that it would have wound up on the same uh, uh, ballot as the mayor's, uh, the mayor's race, but I think uh, the whole idea of uh, you know, people being thwarted in their attempt to uh, exercise uh, you know, their uh, their uh, charter rights under the uh, you know the city's uh, governance, uh, and, and the mayor obviously you know, had a, had a, had a hand in this, as did Council President Kelly. I think uh, you know uh, whether 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 somehow that was maybe a, a, a an unintended consequence or maybe a secondary uh, intention of pulling it at this time. I mean, I think it uh, maybe does benefit Mayor Jackson some in the mayor's race. I suspect that the long-term effect of this is that the city council and the mayor will be more likely to play by the rules when people bring in petitions. Twice in the past year, we've had people play by the rules, follow the law, seek to put something on the ballot, and twice you've seen the city now illegally, both times, thwart that effort and get, get bitten by it. 
Uh, I think the next time somebody brings in petitions following the rules, the city will follow the rules also. Hmm. Well, that's so hard to follow. I mean, the 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 city wound up suing itself in a in a sense here, and and, and it's like uh, we're 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 suing us, so we'll make sure that we'll do the right thing. It's a, it's just <laughs> kind of very well. To an old guy sitting on the sidelines, just very hard to follow. <laughs> So this, this question is uh, directed to Mr. Hardiman, but, but obviously you guys might have something to add to. <laughs> Our state system of funding education was deemed unconstitutional decades ago. What can the mayor do and what can we do to assist the mayor to bring attention to and resolution to this situation? I have never understood that Deroth decision because you're absolutely right. Our system of funding our schools based on property taxes was declared unconstitutional, has been up and down uh, several times, and finally, uh, uh, I think the decision was made, this is too complicated, we'll leave well enough alone. I think the solution for our schools is not with the executive branch, but with the legislative branch. We've got to figure out a way to fund our schools that's fair. Why should a kid in Beechwood get a laptop when they get into the seventh grade, and a kid in Cleveland is using books that were written 30 years ago? Uh, we spend, I think, uh, statewide about $12,000 per child. I'm not sure what we spend on children's, uh, children in Cleveland, but it's not $12,000, I can assure you of that. Our system is broken, and our legislators have got, legislators have got to take this seriously as opposed to sticking their head in the sand. And that's one of the reasons that people move to certain communities because of the school system, particularly if they have kids or expecting to have children. So yes, our system of funding schools is unconstitutional. It's been unconstitutional for many, many, many years, and we choose not to do a thing about it. All right. Uh Will Cleveland even get released from its police consent decree? Yes, <laughs> eventually. I think it's set to expire in 2019. Um, but the reality is it can be extended if the judge concludes that they have not made the progress that he thinks they should make. Uh, this will not become another school case under Frank Battisti that went on for 25 some odd years. Um, Cleveland does not want to be under a consent decree. Eventually, the court will conclude that they have accomplished what they were ordered to do, or they've gone so far and we can't do anything more with what we've got to work with. But eventually, they will be off from under that consent decree. Do you think uh, Attorney General Sessions' public statements that eh, we're not so much interested in these consent decrees uh, uh, anymore will uh, maybe somehow uh, weaken at least the federal government's commitment to see this through? Oh, I think it already has. Yeah. Uh, whether or not it will uh, affect Judge Solomon Oliver is a different issue because he's not bound by what Sessions said, even though they both are from Alabama, uh, for whatever yeah, that's right. worth, uh, nor is he bound by what uh, the president says. But oftentimes the president has a lot of power. Uh, didn't he just pardon somebody for doing something illegal? <laughs> That's another story, though. <laughs> I, 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 th that question presumes that the city might not want to follow it. But I, I, I actually believe Frank Jackson wants the consent decree to be effective. I mean, he still lives in a neighborhood where people talk about what police are doing. Um, going back many mayors, uh, there have been efforts made to bring this police department under control. This consent decree is really the only method that has a chance of succeeding and i believe that the city does want to enforce it so you got a judge that wants to do it you got the the city that wants to do it and a prosecutor's office that's not trying to pull out of it there's no reason to think it won't move forward mm -hmm. next question will cleveland ever agree to more significant steps towards regionalism well the through the Water Department, they've done some of that. Um, but Frank Jackson, you know, look at East Cleveland. I mean, his, his whole attitude there is, I'm not doing that unless they ask me to. I'm, I'm not going to use the muscle of Cleveland 
to take that over. It would be interesting if you had a mayor that started looking at some of the inner ring suburbs that are that are challenged, the Cleveland Heights and, and some of and Euclid, and so, you know, if we merged, we're bigger, we we have more muscle, we could do more things together. But that's not Jackson's way, and I don't think any of the other candidates have talked about it. Just just think what we could have if we had a regional school system. We would have probably one of the best school systems in the country if we regionalize. But is Fairview Park going to want to partner with Cleveland? Are they going to want to send their little babies into uh, over to Glenville? Uh, I don't think so. So everybody has created their own separate fiefdom. And to incorporate the various burbs, even the inner ring burbs into the city of Cleveland, uh, would create a lot of resistance. Take a look at what happened in East Cleveland. They didn't want to come to Cleveland, and they talked about all the heritage and all the history that went with East Cleveland, even though they couldn't pay their bills. But they were very reluctant to even start to engage in the conversation. Well, and even, even out in the suburbs, you have all of these redundancies where everybody's got a finance department, everybody's sure. got a, a public service department. Of course. But, okay, so Ed Fitzgerald, I think, when he was in office, did a little, a little bit of a, a dainty push trying to work with uh, a number of suburbs in uh, Orange and... Uh, uh, Bruce Acres, Pepper Pike, uh, a number of those smaller posted stamp Wade Hills uh, communities out there. And after a couple of years of trying to roll the stone up the hill, even that just collapsed and didn't happen. So it, it might be a lot more logical for that to ha for initiative for that to, to come from the county. Uh, uh, but again, I, I think there's, uh, you know, this, this would, to be successful, this would have, this would have to be uh, from, you know, originating in the communities and not imposed on the communities and I, I just don't I just don't see cities willing to g give up their uh, well, how, their, how, their flexibility and how independence. Did, how, how did Columbus do it? Did they do the same Water thing? diplomacy. Right. They, they had the system that said you want you know you want water you'll be you'll join Columbus. <laughs> and apparently we don't have that muscle. Well I think <laughs> the ship has sailed. Yeah. Well the the uh, Chris, you, were meant, you mentioned the water department playing some part, and I think what you're referring to is the no poaching. The no poaching agreement, but that, that's such a tiny step. Look, the problem is every one of these cities has a mayor and city council. None of them want to give up their jobs. And so the only time we've had it is the, the former East Cleveland mayor, and you saw what happened to him. Yeah. He was recalled. <laughs> that's right. So next question is, uh, you as a panel are pretty critical of Mayor Jackson's performance. What should we as a community, all of us, do in the future to find and get behind strong candidates for mayor? You know, I, we've been criticizing the elements of his performance that merit criticism, but I, but I, I would hate for it to be lost on people, the, the progress that the city did make these last 12 years in some of the most trying times. Even up onto the eve of the RNC, people were predicting Cleveland would fail miserably at hosting that, and it turned out to be a, uh, a huge success. Frank Jackson's evolution as mayor in his first four years, it was always about shoring up the finances. In his second term, he started to have big ideas like Public Square. In his third term, uh, he weathered some very difficult challenges involving the police department, the RNC. And he, if he were to have left office at the end of the 12 years, I think his legacy would have been quite strong. That could change in the next four years. So I just, I don't want to, I don't want people to leave thinking that this has just been a criticism of Frank Jackson. No, I mean, we're, we're not just up here bashing him. I don't think, I think uh, there's a basic sense here. Well, I don't mean to speak for everybody, but I, that, you know, he's a decent man. He's uh, uh, interested in public service. He's uh, uh, trustworthy and uh, has, you know, got a good moral compass. Uh, and uh, I think, by and large, voters have found him fairly likable over the uh, his first three terms uh, in office. But the, but the question now is, uh, you know, is Jackson fatigue perhaps uh, setting in? I think it was someone that said, uh, and I can't remember who, that if you worship the sun, you'll never understand it. And I think to some extent, we are trying to understand the sun. And we're taking a look at what he has done, and to some degree, what he has not done. And of course, if I were in charge, or when I become king, things will be perfect. In the meantime, <laughs> we're stuck with the politicians that we have. But your question is, what can be done to find the new candidates? Sure. Um, uh, you're seeing quite a few 
uh, what is it, 40 some candidates in the council races. It, and you're seeing very young candidates. Um, uh, Mandelon is 32 years old. Um, that next generation seems to be pushing. Blaine Griffin is running for council, and, and you know, or is a councilman. He was appointed, and he's running to, to retain the seat. He could be a future leader for the city. I mean, you're seeing people that, that offer some hope. Mm -hmm. Although Frank Jackson did say that the key reason that he decided to run was that no one came forward that he thought was worth it, uh, which even though those folks that you mentioned are, mm -hmm. you know, Blaine Griffin is, uh, he didn't express interest in this, and we don't he know. Expressed interest well, he didn't have the experience. I mean, he, he basically, he'd, he'd been one of you know, the mayor's uh, team members, but hadn't been in a, uh, you know, independent uh, office holding job mm -hmm. himself. And so, I mean, I think, I think it's pretty evident what he's doing. That's why he's running for council to set the table for an eventual mayor's run. It's also respect. They're, they were waiting to see if he would run before they would decide. But if he hadn't run, you'd have seen a Matt Zone or Kevin Kelly or Chris Ronane or Blaine uh, throwing their hat in the ring. Mm -hmm. I, that, Jackson's statement that, that he had to do it by default doesn't ring very true. There were plenty of people, I think, who would have put their hat in the ring. Hmm. Next question. A key problem with big cities is flight to suburbs. Why don't you guys live in Cleveland? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's been a recurring theme ever since, uh, I think, following World War II. And initially, it was white flight, and subsequently became black flight out of the city. And uh, was it Fannie Lewis that started the construction boom prior to her death and built some very, very attractive houses? We had, um, I can't remember how many years ago, but we used to have a residency requirement for people that uh, worked for the police department or the uh, uh, fire department. And uh, that made all the sense in the world to me. But both firemen and policemen fought that. And so now firemen and policemen that are employed by the city can live anywhere they want to. Is that a good thing for the city? I don't think so, but that's the law as it stands right now. So um, I followed Tom Barris out to the suburbs. Otherwise, I'd be in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess just to be, just to be honest, I was, I was kind of a, a body at rest tends to remain at rest here. I was born in, uh, in lived in Westlake, uh, uh, the, uh, the pre-Crocker Park Westlake when it was all uh, fruit trees and uh, and cornfields, and uh, just pretty much stayed uh, out in that part of the community. I live in Rocky River now, uh, but actually, my wife and I are sort of in a uh, you know when we get wild and crazy, what do we want to do? Moments here, uh, here, thinking about moving out of our house, thinking about maybe maybe moving somewhere in, in, into a Cleveland neighborhood. Long, probably a long way from pulling the trigger on it, but the thoughts occurred to us. I, I moved to town 21 years ago. I was living in Florida, visited Cleveland. A friend here took me on a tour at Cleveland Heights, and, and we just fell in love with it. So we moved there, and I've been there for 21 years. If we were coming up today, um, we very likely would have chosen Cleveland. It's just that's the neighborhood we visited. I'll, I'll answer, too. I live in Bay Village. Uh, I have two little kids who are six years old and three. I chose, uh, we were living in Lakewood before we moved to Bay, to Bay Village, and we moved there for the schools. And also, um, to be perfectly honest, police response. When we lived in Lakewood, you could call the police and you knew they would be there within minutes, no matter what you were calling about. I think I called about a barking dog in the middle of the night and they came to check it out. And I have heard so many stories in Cleveland about people calling the police for pretty serious things. And the cops would say, come and file your report when you have time, we're not going to send somebody. And, uh, you know, so that's the honest response, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. Who is the Cleveland politician today with the brightest future? Oh, that's a good one. Mm. Nina Turner. Nina Turner. Hmm. I, I would say Nina Turner. Hmm. She, uh, she's inspirational 
as far I, as I I'm think concerned. She, I think she fits in that category, or at least people speculated That's right. that she might run for mayor uh, had the mayor not run yes. for mayor. Uh, I think she's pretty happy right now with her high-profile uh, cable news commentating job. But, uh, you know, she's, she's still pretty active here with that progressive group, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Our revolution. Called our revolution. Yes. Mm. That would be my candidate. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say Calvin Williams. It's just he is, uh, there's nobody's seen a downside. He, um, he has, he's been at all the places at the right times. Um, his personal story is tremendous. He, he just, he, he, he has reacted to everything exactly as you would hope. And if he in four years were to run, I think he'd have a, a very good chance of winning. Well, not to throw a damper on that. And, and, and again, what they said yesterday isn't what they'll say tomorrow. But I, I remember before I left that a sidebar conversation with him where he basically just said, I have so many years for retirement. I'm just looking to, to, to get there and improve the department as much as I can along the way. I got no interest in politics. I think he's telling a different story now. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> so the flip side of, the, of this question, which incumbent council people might lose in September or November? I, I think the one who's probably facing the most difficult challenge is Terrell Pruitt. Um, not because he's done a bad job. He's, uh, he's actually regarded as one of the best minds on council. Uh, he's running against Joe Jones, who was the councilman for that ward 10 years ago. He actually got convicted of a, of a crime, but it's all been um, tossed. And Joe, I covered him when he was on council, and he was very strong on constituent service. He got the driveways plowed and the leaves raked for the seniors. Uh, anytime he got a call, he dealt with it. Uh, Terrell Pruitt's in the military, and while he was away, uh, there was a breakdown in constituent service, and I think Joe is is campaigning pretty hard on that. Um, we'll have to see whether he's as beloved now as he was then. Any other thoughts from the Isn't panel? I, again, I'm kind of out of, out of the mix here, but I mean, the T.J. Dow has a lot of strong Dow. people running against him, a lot of interesting people right. running against Jones him. Bashir Jones, Bashir Mansfield Jones. Fraser. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think TJ is vulnerable um, also. Yeah. This is a good one for, oh, go ahead, you wanted well, to. Well, the, the other one that's a wild card, and we, we've been writing about him, you've been writing about him lately, is Richard Starr is running against mm -hmm. Phyllis Cleveland in Central. There's a good bit of dissatisfaction uh, in Central with how the quality of life is. And so Richard's pretty beloved out there. He, he doesn't have a lot of experience, but um, you could see some turnover possibly mm -hmm. there. This is a great question, I think, for, for you guys. Who was the best mayor in the past 50 years and why? I haven't been here for 50 years, so I really <laughs> can't answer that. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Political consciousness doesn't go quite that far back. But uh, uh, I, I guess maybe just uh, of, the, of the people that I have covered in the 37 years that I worked at Channel 3, uh, um, I would say uh, uh, the first the first two terms of Mike White. Mike White, the third term may be uh, a little more <laughs> problematic, <laughs> but uh, I think in terms of you know being bold, decisive, you know, uh, and, and and just uh, seeing what he wanted to do, uh, uh, th you know, through completion and being take charge, and, and and a feeling like he was running the city, a feeling like he was in charge. I guess I would reluctantly agree with that. Um, I see all the warts that other mayors have had over the years, and I've been around more than 50, so. Uh, I, I mean, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't here, I was in Carl Stokes, for instance. I wasn't here for Carl Stokes. Yeah, I, w I was. Yeah. Carl had a big fight with the police department, and they were hell-bent on getting rid of Carl Stokes, or at least controlling him. Uh, Dennis Kucinich, you know, the city did have all kinds of problems when he tried to sa uh, save uh, the public utility. Jane Campbell was in and out. She got a cup of coffee uh, while she was mayor of the city. Um, what about George Voinovich? I've got some serious concerns about George Voinovich because when George Voinovich was uh, mayor, the question was who was running the city. 
was it King? Well, like I said, King George. If you if you if you if you if you, okay. if you partnered the uh, George V with George F, uh, maybe the combination would right. get, would get the, uh, the the nod. But um, uh, I think by default, I, I, I would tend to agree, Mike White in his probably first couple of terms. Yeah. I have. I, I don't have enough years to enough to to no. offer that. Though I was surprised to see that neither neither, or maybe I'm wrong here. We had you had the 50 most prominent uh, people in Cleveland history, uh, and I was surprised to see neither Mike nor George were were in that selection process. Don't 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 put too much credibility in those lists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> so, just to be clear, Frank Jackson is not even a runner-up in this uh, <laughs> discussion. I, I think it's hard to, it, it's immediate. You need the passage of time to right. tell let's, how let's, strong somebody is. To see someone's rose-colored glasses. Let's see, how all, this, <laughs> let's see all this stuff that's partway yeah, done that's turns true. out. Right. Um, so this is a very direct question. Who would you vote for if you lived here? On the spot. That was a question that was put to me as I was walking in the door. And my <laughs> answer was, I don't know. I would have to get a lot more information than I have right now. I can see the incumbents' problems. I can see the top two challengers. I can see their problems. And their, I have a lot of concerns about things that they've said. Uh, but I also think that it may be time for a change. But is there anybody... Uh, waiting on deck that is prepared to take on the challenges of a major city. And I'm still uh, planted firmly on the fence. I, um, well, I mean, what, what I think's already been told, we endorsed Frank Jackson um, uh, Sunday. Um, I, think, I think we fit in that same pattern of most of the people we're talking to. It's time for a change, but none of the options are better are, are, are the than a fourth term. Yeah. Not, not at all crazy about a fourth term. You know, we know in Mike White's third term, things were not great, um, but, but the options are not better. I mean, Frank is going to have a lot of, I mean, Mayor Jackson is going to have a lot of problems. I mean, a number of his top, uh, well, whether you, whether you agree, there's maybe they're time to make some changes in his uh, team members, but he's, okay, so... Mr. Griffin, who was very effective in the uh, community relations department, his chief of staff has moved on, so and I think there are a number of his other, uh, uh, you know, cabinet level people who are not going to be around for a fourth term, and 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 so you know, you you wonder if uh, they'll just be replaced with chair warmers or whether he's going to try to really upgrade. Well, you can't you can't look to the future because anybody who comes knows it's just for right for years. one term. One Correct. person he might tap into is Bill Patman. He has, he's done fairly, he's, he's, um, he knows a lot. And, and he's been very good in this campaign. He wants to remain relevant. Um, and he might be a good guy to bring into the administration. Right. He knows a lot about city government and right. yeah, he wouldn't, could hit the ground running. Is there a candidate in the field that you think might be the most perilous choice, the most, uh, risky? Probably, but there are uh, slander and libel laws <laughs> in, in place. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> well. I think that's. Uh, I think that's time. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for staying with us and for all the good questions.